Okay, let's move on to our first two topics today as we talk energy with expert Adam Siminski from Capsarc. The circular carbon economy concept has gained enormous momentum in recent years as the best way for individual nations to combat climate change. Um, It is a, Adam, as you have previously described it, a holistic approach that uses all the tools in the toolbox to reduce emissions. Um, The G20 has endorsed the CCE in 2020, and one of Capstart's many ongoing research projects is something we want to start with here, the Circular Carbon Economy Index Project, which is a tool for governments and other climate change policy stakeholders to evaluate progress in support of domestic planning and decision making in the nexus of energy, emissions, and the economy. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Aramco have adopted the circular Circular Carbon Economy Framework as a way to reduce their carbon footprints. Adam, let's start by talking about what Saudi Arabia is doing now and is planning to do in order to achieve a fully circular carbon economy nationally. Uh, sure, I'd be uh, delighted to do that. Before I do, uh, you know, it does actually snow uh, up in the uh, region up by Al Ula in the uh, northern part of Saudi Arabia, and when it does, you you, you get all kinds of uh, pictures posted on Twitter of the Saudis uh, enjoying the snow. Not enough to ski on though, but so that indoor mall is gonna be really interesting. <laughs> um, the circular carbon economy. Well, um, look, it's you actually framed it very nicely. It's, a, it's really a concept. It is, it is uh, an approach and it's open for everybody, not just Saudi Arabia. I mean, it, so the idea is to take something that is very well known and accepted the circular economy, where we say we need to reduce, we need to reuse and recycle generally materials in the economy, and then extend it with another R, remove, to carbon. So if you say, you know, well, what are these things in the circular carbon economy concept? What are the four R's? Uh, Again, reduce, reuse, recycle, and remove. Uh, Reduce are things like energy efficiency, uh, and renewables. Uh, it also includes nuclear power, by the way, uh, and hydrogen can fit in that one as well. But And Saudi Arabia is all in favor of efficiency, and Saudi Arabia is all in favor of renewables, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, reuse and recycle are all kinds of really interesting things that SABIC and Saudi Aramco have underway already to uh, try to take carbon dioxide and, uh, uh, and use it uh, in uh, products that can be sold, help grow the economy, help create jobs. Uh, things like producing methanol, uh, producing fertilizers, uh, urea from uh, carbon uh, dioxide. The really interesting part that for the kingdom is to come to the remove aspect. And there are all kinds of things that you can do and remove. Uh, you can remove geologically by storing uh, carbon dioxide in, in saline reservoirs or in oil and gas. Uh, reservoirs. You can remove it biologically. Uh, There are uh, mangrove restoration projects being considered in the kingdom, tree planting programs and so on. And that's another way to remove carbon dioxide. Uh, There are some really uh, clever uh, projects that are underway around the world. And I think you're going to see this in Saudi Arabia for direct air capture, literally pulling uh, carbon dioxide right out of the atmosphere. So you, you come back to, so we're going to use all of these tools in the toolbox that you mentioned. You know, if you're going to build a house, you need more than just a hammer. You know, you're, you need uh, all kinds of, of, of ways to approach it. And that's the multiple pathways. Uh, let's get this done uh, with as many different uh, technologies as we can that make sense for individual countries and their own circumstances. So it's, uh, it's really kind of a, an interesting idea. The the problem, uh, you know, I think comes where a lot of people just say, oh, well, we've been hearing about this and we just don't believe that it's going to happen. And that's why we just want to pick a single pathway. We just want renewables and we don't want anything else. Problem is, is that won't actually get the job done. And it could leave us, you know, as we saw this this uh, summer and, and even now in terms of natural gas prices in Europe and elsewhere, it could leave us stuck between, you know, stuck in the midst of this global energy conversion. Um, 
Adam, we, we, we spent a lot of time in some earlier episodes on the COP26 in Glasgow in November. It's mm -hmm. fascinating, and it's been interesting to watch Saudi Arabia's uh, path uh, from sort of digging their heels in a little bit to being, you know, the, the green initiative and, and being much more participatory, participatory. But one of the big messages uh, that, you know, that they were carrying, especially the Minister of Energy, Prince uh, Abdulaziz bin Salman, was that, you know, we need to do exactly what you're saying. We can't just go to renewables. We can't just, we, we need to look at the broader issue of reducing um, uh, emissions uh, in a variety of ways. And he continues to pound that drum. He was just at the World Economic Forum talking about the very same thing. W one of the questions and one of the criticisms is, okay, okay, we're open to this, but w is the technology there? And is it scalable? Well, that, you know, there, there's no perfect energy source. <laughs> I mean, every form of energy has its own set of problems. Uh, the storage of uh, carbon dioxide in geologic uh, formations has been going on for years. Uh, Norway was doing it uh, in one of their big fields. There was a lot of experience with this. The geologists are pretty comfortable with the whole idea and this is scalable. So uh, the, you know, the CCUS, carbon capture utilization and storage, uh, that storage aspect, I think, is really pretty well known and it's scalable. The other thing that's really scalable uh, is uh, some of these green initiatives, like the Saudi Green Initiative, uh, having to do with forestry and then looking at ocean-based uh, kinds of storage, uh, both uh, in the ocean, on the shoreline, like mangroves and on land uh, uh, forestry. Uh, there are some really interesting uh, aspects of, of seaweed that can actually store relatively permanently uh, carbon uh, dioxide. Same thing is true for mangroves. They actually change the soil chemistry and lock up the uh, CO2. Uh, so I, I think these technologies are known in many cases. It's a question of cost. Well, uh, solar used to be uh, costly and a lot of money went into solar, brought the cost down. It became scalable uh, and we were very successful in doing that. Did the same thing with wind. Mm -hmm. Now I think we just have to move on, and do the same thing with some of these other technologies, including direct air capture. And I assume you, 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 you'd want to throw hydrogen in there as well, particularly green hydrogen in terms of, of that oh. cycle. Achieving yeah, that cycle. absolutely. Uh, and and really, there's nothing wrong with blue hydrogen either, even though sometimes you get the environmentalists saying, well, they don't like that. Uh, blue hydrogen is just using you know, what would otherwise be gray hydrogen, using uh, hydrocarbons to make the hydrogen, capturing the CO2 that comes off of that and storing it. So if you store all of the CO2 that comes off of it, then uh, there's really no difference, in a sense, between that and green hydrogen, which is usually thought of as using solar and wind to uh, electrolyze water into hydrogen and, and oxygen. Uh, these, uh, these technologies, and that one is kind of expensive, too. I mean, there is no, uh, it, it's, we may actually make more progress early on with blue hydrogen than with green because of the costs associated uh, with doing it. Uh, there's, a, I've read a lot of interesting things on on blue versus green and and uh, the technolo technological uh, challenges of green. Uh, but with regard to Saudi Arabia's efforts, there's a couple of questions if, if I can throw them out there. One of the things in that reduced list, you know, energy efficiency, non biorenewables, nuclear energy, but it was also fuel switching. And mm -hmm. um, I, I, I assume this is something along the Jafura plant where they're, they're expanding their, their gas production in order to replace uh, crude that's used for power and, and that sort of thing. And, and, and so that's what, you know, that reduces the overall emissions. Is, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about fuel switching. Right. Uh, in Saudi Arabia today, there's about 70 gigawatts of electric capacity. 40% uh, of that is oil and liquids, 60% uh, of that is natural gas, very small percentage right now is, is uh, renewables. 
but there are big plans uh, to grow renewables between now and 2030 uh, so that the mix will be closer to half gas and half renewables, uh, mostly solar, but some wind thrown in. Uh, there are uh, plans uh, 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 being drafted up uh, right now uh, for some, you know, three dozen uh, kind of solar and wind farms. Uh, about a dozen of those would be uh, wind farms. The other two dozen would be a mixture of uh, photovoltaic solar and concentrated solar power, uh, about four of those kind of plants. And that, uh, it, that's how the kingdom plans to get to that, uh, that uh, you know, what I would call a stretch target of half of the electricity in the kingdom coming from renewables uh, by 2030. Yeah, I, 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 I think that the kingdom uses 3.5 million barrels a day on power and electricity, which is an enormous number compared to, you know, other countries of larger size. And so any kind of, any way to mitigate that is a plus, as you say, that's the, the, um, that, that number goes up and down Right. when, when you're using the most is during the summertime when it's hot, you need air right. conditioning. And so that comes back to another thing where the kingdom is actually showing a lot of leadership. Uh, some uh, uh, number of years ago, uh, Prince Abdulaziz uh, bin Salman, his uh, Royal Highness, uh, the Minister of Energy, uh, worked on efficiency standards for air conditioners in the kingdom. So the kingdom has some fairly decent uh, air conditioning efficiency standards, among, among others. And that's helping to flatten out the growth in, uh, in the need for electricity. It gets really hot here in the summertime, you know, for, you know, we often, you know, in, in, uh, in Celsius, we see 50 degrees, you know, for, for those of you uh, in the United States, that's, you know, 120 <laughs> and, and that's really hot. And we, and interestingly, this isn't just Saudi Arabia, it's in the region, but across Asia and places in Africa and Latin America, there's also uh, big economic growth, big population growth, and huge need for air conditioning. The IEA, uh, International Energy Agency, calculates that the fastest growing need for electricity, uh, probably beyond Bitcoin in the short run, is, uh, <laughs> is uh, air conditioning uh, in developing countries. Yeah, yeah. And that, the, as you say, temperatures are rising because the reason that wet, wet bulb index is going to be really problematic for too long in, in a number of places around the Gulf. Um, I, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I just wanted to jump in. There was, there's one other thing that I, I wanted to mention, and, and that is when you think about things like the growth in air conditioning, there are a lot of people in the world that don't have electricity. I mean, there's a billion people that don't have electricity. There's uh, and there's a, more than that, maybe a billion and a half that don't have clean cooking fuel, right? And the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which a lot of people really believe in, I mean, we should deliver on those, uh, say that there should be access uh, for everybody to clean, modern, uh, affordable uh, energy. And, and I think in, this is what you were saying, uh, Richard, in the in the short run, we just can't switch over to renewables. There's there are a lot of needs that can only be supplied uh, for a decade or two or three to come uh, from from oil and natural gas. And so we just need to find a way to to use it uh, without creating environmental harm. And I think it's possible. Is it your sense? Uh, just globally, if you look at the the acceptance of the the concept circular carbon economy (CCUS), and and we we spent some time talking about the G20, of course, last year, the the, the one in Riyadh, and and one of the coups we thought, or one of the really positive things for Saudi Arabia coming to that was the G20 endorsing CCE essentially. Right. Um, is it your sense that it's becoming more broadly accepted as a viable alternative? You know, I think that there's still a little bit of reluctance because uh, I think there's this just general feeling that the problem keeps getting worse and somebody must be responsible for that. Nobody wants to look in the mirror and say, hey, you know, you're responsible. Uh, and 
and uh, it's pretty easy uh, to uh, blame uh, the producers of, of hydrocarbons. You know, you kind of get into a really interesting, uh, I don't know, uh, question. Uh, you know, who should be responsible for uh, uh, the consumption of gasoline? Should it be the oil companies that, that produce the oil and refine the gasoline? Or should it be the the uh, refiners, uh, you know, should it be the, the gasoline stations or should it be the consumers who are putting it in their cars and, and using it? And, you know, there's, there's actually a name for that. They call it scope one, scope two, and scope three, you know, emissions. And scope three is down at the consumer level. And, you know, I think that it ought to be the users to take some responsibility for, for these emissions. Well, that scope three issue is an interesting one. And, and uh, I think the Saudis were feeling that when they were pinged and criticized for their, their, uh, their NDCs and their, their uh, commitments, when people say, well, what do you haven't addressed the scope three? And I, I think the, the natural response is to say, look, we anticipate we're preparing for going out of business at some point with terms of our fossil fuels, but that doesn't mean we should just close up shop right now. Um, and that's that's their point. There's better ways to do this, but exactly that scope three that uh, that scope three section is kind of an orphan, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's the one I said. Look in the mirror and yeah. try, and try <laughs> to see who who ought to take some of the responsibility. You know, back to the to the G20. Uh, you know, that's uh, that's pretty interesting because the G20 has just as many um, oil consumers consuming nations, you know, in it as they do producing nations. And uh, the uh, ministers uh, and leaders, so it was, this was endorsed by uh, the, at the leaders summit, uh, you know, what they said is, well, it, it kind of hit in all of the, the right areas. It was voluntary. It was holistic. It was integrated. Uh, it was inclusive. And, uh, and, and, and the board that I like the best, it's pragmatic. You know, I'm really in favor of pragmatic solutions that can actually be implemented. And uh, and coming back to that does not exclude renewables. It does not exclude efficiency. The Saudis have uh, some of the strongest auto fuel efficiency standards that exist. Yeah, they're they're uh, similar to the the standards in the U.S., which are fairly stringent. And the the uh, when you think about this. Uh, what Saudi Arabia and a lot of other oil producing countries are saying is don't write us off. There's still a demand for this product coming from consumers who need it. Uh, families that don't have clean cooking fuels, maybe propane is really the interim solution. But, you know, does it create carbon dioxide? Yes. Well, we'll figure out a way with technology to deal with that. You know, that, that we can do it. Um, but but the idea that we're going to overnight turn the switch and and ban fossil fuels and you, and I've actually seen proposals for that. That's like that's like that's uh, really uh, you know what uh, what uh, Prince Abdulaziz uh, says is la la land. That just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it's uh, it's not realistic in in many ways. Even though climate change is obviously a real issue. Um, it's it's fascinating looking at Saudi Arabia and, and a lot of people, I think, just by default assume that this global energy transition is a crisis for uh, major oil producers. And in many ways, you can look at it that way. The, the sense I get from Saudi, and I think Lucian, you'll agree, is that increasingly they see it as an opportunity to make this transition and 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 they look you know they they look closely at the solar and the onshore wind trajectory and and they sort of see that happening and in the 2020s is is a very critical decade and even cut it down to maybe 5 years but they they see they see that and they want to be at the heart of the emergence of the technologies in terms of carbon capture in terms of hydrogen and just looking at carbon capture, when when you look at at place like Saudi Arabia, they seem to have certain advantages. In other words, they they have they have natural sinks, they have uh, very um, f fairly localized emissions, you know, at the, at uh, processing and and things like that. So, you know, the, the 
actual technology and being able to capture these carbon emissions, they, they might have a pretty good shot at doing, you know, making real inroads here. Would you agree? I think that that's, uh, that's a really interesting thought because a lot of the, you know, most of the oil production in the kingdom uh, is concentrated in the eastern province over by the, uh, uh, the uh, Arab Gulf. And the, the, there is an industrial city there called Jubail. It's uh, north of Dakran and Dammam, uh, where Aramco is headquartered. And in that industrial city, there's a lot of users of, uh, of fossil fuels, chemical plants and refineries and so on. Uh, and there's production and nearby there's places to store. Uh, there's port facilities there. So you could do a, a lot. You could create a hub for both carbon dioxide and hydrogen, you know, in the Jubail area. Uh, and and with relatively uh, short pipeline distances, be able to collect and distribute both hydrogen and CO2 from the from the uh, kinds of uh, companies that are creating it to the kinds of companies that can recycle and reuse uh, uh, that that product and and then ultimately remove it and do something with it. Uh, Aramco uh, already sold. Uh, blue hydrogen in the form of ammonia uh, transported to Japan. And you could, you know, again, that's scalable, it's doable. Uh, and there's a lot of geologic places in the kingdom to, uh, to, to store uh, CO2. Even on, on the eastern coast of uh, Saudi Arabia, over by the Red Sea, there's not a lot of oil and gas production. There is some gas there, but the, there are some basaltic rocks that could actually store CO2. So there's lots of opportunities here. And I think what, what needs to be done, not just in Saudi Arabia, but globally, uh, is countries need to push uh, R&D demonstration projects and, and convert those demonstration projects into uh, development and, uh, and get on with it. That's what brought the cost down for solar and wind. And I think the same thing is going to happen have to happen for hydrogen and carbon dioxide. I think it, it's important to add that part of the things that brought down the solar, the solar in particular, was in, sense, in essence making a market. I think Saudi Arabia is trying to do this by hydrogen green, especially green hydrogen, is not economic. Uh, yet there are significant projects moving forward in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere in essence, I think trying to make a market to create this virtuous cycle between, you know, a market technology, a market technology, and learn learn technology to, to, to cut that price. Right. And I think that if you get started on it early when it might be uh, more expensive than, than you would hope, uh, you have uh, a foothold into the technology and the experience needed to actually uh, be uh, able to convert that into scale uh, when it does become profitable. I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think the kingdom strategy is going to be to find a way uh, to turn uh, carbon dioxide into valuable products one way or the other that can be uh, sold in the global marketplace. Endlessly fascinating subject for me. And, and I think uh, for, as I said, a recurring theme on on the uh, 966 because it's so central to, to many things that Saudi Arabia is trying to accomplish in its transition. Um, can, can, I come back, I want to come back, can I come back to one other thing, Richard? The, sure. the, the people that say we just want to ban, uh, you know, hydrocarbons, you know, they're missing a lot that, uh, you know, and we already talked about uh, how access to energy is going to be important for both fairness, equity, uh, and, and reliability. Uh, but in a lot of cases, there are really no practical solutions. I mean, aviation, uh, heavy duty shipping, maritime, uh, trucking, cement manufacturing, metal smelting. Uh, you know, th there are uh, projects underway now to do some, uh, you know, iron and steel production using hydrogen. Uh, but again, it's small and it's expensive, and we need to experiment with that and get the cost down. Uh, 
but the bulk of cement and, and iron and steel produced around the world uh, uh, are very, very energy intensive. And we just can't stop that overnight. So we need to find ways, again, to deal with issues like that. And then finally, there's the issue of of infrastructure. And I think that's what the Europeans learned this winter is you have to be very careful with the existing infrastructure that you don't that you don't somehow throw that away and then discover uh, that uh, that uh, a cold winter or or some other uh, change in the weather uh, completely uh, disrupts the pricing of the products that are so crucial to people in their everyday lives. Yeah, we haven't figured out the intermittency of, of renewables, many of them, which, may, which and we'll have to put this aside at, for another conversation, which sort of leads to Saudi Arabia's interest in nuclear, mm -hmm. uh, which is another leg that I think they want to add to their, their uh, energy mix.